Good evening, and welcome to the chapel at the University of King's College. I am Paul Halley, the Director of Music. I'm assisted by Nick Halley, the Assistant Director of Music, and several members of the chapel choir here among us. This evening, I'm going to talk about Gregorian chant from its beginnings through the 12th century. Chant, as in most religions and cults, probably emerged from the declaiming of sacred texts, which itself proceeded from the cry to the Creator for help in times of distress and shouts of praise in times of gratitude. The journey from declamation to chant is a brief one. Hence the interchangeable terms lector, meaning reader, and cantor, meaning singer, in the early church. We experience this kind of declamatory intoning, or chanting, every Thursday at our solemn Eucharist when the epistle and gospel are sung. Nick is going to give us an example of how this might have happened. O oh, Almighty God, who hast knit together thine elect in one communion and fellowship in the mystical body of thy Son, Christ our Lord, Grant us grace so to follow thy blessed saints in all virtuous and godly living, that we may come to those unspeakable joys which thou hast prepared for them that unfeignedly love thee. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> and you can imagine how in the, in the rather reverberant buildings in which monks and nuns and the faithful in general gathered, the singing of the chant, as Nick just ex explained or demonstrated, would have been very effective from the point of view of audibility. So first of all, a little reassurance. You are in good company. Gregorian chant has many fans. John O'Brien, a 19th century Roman Catholic clergyman and educator, was a professor of liturgy, ecclesiastical history, and sacred theology at Mount St. Mary's College in Emmitsburg, Maryland. In his book, a History of the Mass and Its Ceremonies in the Eastern and Western Church, he writes, The merits of the Gregorian chant are known to all, and who that has ever heard it rendered as it should be will not say that it has a divine influence over the soul. If St. Augustine wept upon hearing the Ambrosian chant, many more recent than he have wept too upon hearing the simple but soul-stirring strains of the pure Gregorian. The Venerable Bede, for example, tells us how deeply affected St. Cuthbert used to be when chanting the preface, so much so that his sobbing could be heard through the entire congregation as he raised his hands on high at the Sursum Corda. His singing was rather a sort of solemn moaning than anything else. The renowned Haydn was often moved to tears at listening to the children of the London Charity Schools sing the psalms together in unison according to the Gregorian style. And the great master of musicians and composers, Mozart, went so far as to say that he would rather be the author of the preface and the Pater Noster according to the same style than of anything he had ever written. These are but a few of the numerous encomiums passed upon this sacred chant by men who were so eminently qualified to constitute themselves judges." End of quote. And Chant, the title of an album of Gregorian chant performed by the Benedictine monks of Santo Domingo de Silos at their monastery in Burgos, Spain, has sold over six million copies and still counting. During the course of the next 40 minutes or so, keep in mind three important features of the first thousand years in which Gregorian chant took root and blossomed. First, Gregorian chant is inseparable from the liturgy of the church. Liturgy coming from the Greek laetos, meaning public, hence laity, and ergos, meaning working. Leiturgia, meaning public service or worship of the gods. Secondly, the bulk of the history and development of Gregorian chant is oral. First attempts at notation probably began in the late 9th century. The only way to learn these chants, of which there were thousands, was to hear them sung by an expert, which meant either the expert or the student had to engage in significant travel and consequently lengthy visits. 
This required the establishment of schools, scola cantorum, associated with monasteries and collegiate churches and cathedrals, in which the rigorous study of chant took place in spite of the lack of any written music. Thirdly, the commercial intercourse between East and West, what we call today the Middle East and the European West, and all places in between, was extensive and profound. Consequently, the exchange of ideas and the sharing of cultural developments was equally extensive and profound. This perpetual cross-fertilization between East and West can be difficult for modern minds to grasp. So here's a potted history of Gregorian chant from day one. It was rooted in the pre-Christian services of the Jews. Jewish and Christian ceremonial meals were essentially very similar for the first couple of centuries of the Common Era. It adopted distinctive characteristics as early as the third and fourth centuries. It was fully developed by the seventh century. And during the ensuing 400 years, it was considerably expanded. And then in the 16th century, it was considerably deteriorated. Finally, in the 19th century, it was restored and is used at present in essentially the same form it had acquired about 1,000 years ago. Early Christian rites incorporated elements of Jewish worship that survived in later chant tradition. The daily office hours in monasteries have their roots in Jewish prayer hours. Amen and Alleluia come from the Hebrew, and the threefold sanctus derives from the threefold kadosh of the kedusha. James McKinnon, in his excellent little book, Music in Early Christian Literature, writes, there is a brief reference in the New Testament Gospels of Matthew and Mark that indicates that the Last Supper was concluded with the singing of a hymn. This singing by Jesus and the apostles at a Jewish ceremonial meal, whether the Passover Seder or not, furnishes a link with Jewish musical practice on the one hand, and on the other, with the Christian practice of the immediately succeeding centuries. In his first letter to the Church of Corinth, St. Paul provides an insight into the debate in the early church around the appropriateness of singing and possibly playing instruments in the context of a religious service. He writes, what then? I will pray with the spirit and I will pray with the mind also. I will sing, salo, with the spirit and I will sing with the mind also. Again, for our modern sensibility which associates music with feeling, the notion of music as science is difficult to understand, but for the early church, the inherited perception of music was as one of the mathematical arts comprising the quadrivium, arithmetic, music, geometry, and astronomy, along with the trivium of the language arts, grammar, rhetoric, and dialectic. The ensuing debate among the church fathers, which continues to this day, was not about the appropriateness of music in the liturgy, but about the quality and suitability of that music. Pliny the Younger, when he was the governor of Bithynia and Pontus in the early second century, wrote a letter to the emperor Trajan seeking guidance on how to deal with lapsed Christians. He says, they, the Christians, affirmed, however, that this was the extent of their fault or error, that they were wont to assemble on a set day before dawn and to sing a hymn among themselves to the Christ as to a god. Fast forward to the vigil, as found in the fourth century, divided into three separate prayer hours. One at sunset, when the lamps were lighted, called lucernarium, lux, meaning light. One after midnight, and one at sunrise, called laudes matutine, morning praise. Eventually, these received the names vespers, matins, and lauds, forming three of the eight office hours found in the rule of St. Benedict in the 6th century. The Easter Vigil here at King's is essentially unchanged since the 5th century. Other ancient witnesses such as Pope Clement I, Bishop of Rome, Tertullian of Carthage, St. Athanasius of Alexandria, and Egeria, who wrote a diary about her pilgrimage to Jerusalem in the early 380s, confirm the Christian's practice of singing hymns and psalms although we can't sadly know how the music sounded during this period. 
During the third and fourth centuries, the documentation concerning the development of Western chant is very thin, but we know the chants sung during the monastic canonical hours have their roots in the early fourth century with the desert monks of Egypt and Palestine. Here's McKinnon again. We observe these monks chanting the Psalter from memory for a substantial part of the day and night. As is true today, they got through the entire body of 150 psalms in one week. We observe also, as the monastic movement developed and spread in the second half of the fourth century, how the original Egyptian mode of virtually continuous prayer and psalmody was relaxed, and the day was broken down into set times for common meeting. These corresponded precisely to the six medieval office hours of matins, lauds, terse, sext, nonne, and vespers, with only prime and compline yet to be established. By the second half of the fourth century, monastic communities have been established in the principal eastern urban centers, and the monastic office virtually inundated the cathedral office with psalmody. During this time also, Greek was replaced by Latin as the official language of the Western Church. Around 340 in the Common Era, St. Athanasius visited Rome, accompanied by two Egyptian monks who were disciples of the famous St. Anthony. The publication of the Vita Antonii helped to spread the knowledge of Egyptian monastic practices. Distinctive regional traditions of Western Plain Chant arose during this time, notably in the British Isles, being Celtic chant, in Spain, being Visigothic, later called Mozarabic chant, in Gaul, known as Gallican chant, and in Italy, Old Roman, Ambrosian, and Beneventan chant. John the Deacon, the ninth century biographer of Pope Gregory, modestly claimed that the saint, quote, compiled a patchwork antiphonary i.e. a random collection of chants used for the divine office. Gregory reorganized the Schola Cantorum, the singing school, and established a more uniform standard in church services, gathering chants from among the regional traditions as widely as he could imagine. Of those, he retained what he could, revised where necessary, and assigned particular chants to the various services. His goal was to organize the bodies of chants from diverse traditions into a uniform and orderly whole for use by the entire western region of the church. While later legends magnified his real achievements, he was often depicted as receiving the dictation of plain chant from a dove representing the Holy Spirit, thus giving Gregorian chant the stamp of being divinely inspired. These significant steps may account for why his name came to be attached to Gregorian chant. The late 8th century saw a steadily increasing influence of the Carolingian monarchs. During a visit to Gaul in 752 to 753, Pope Stephen II celebrated Mass using Roman chant. According to Charlemagne, his father Pepin abolished the local Gallican rites in favor of the Roman use in order to strengthen ties with Rome. Thirty years later, at Charlemagne's request, Pope Adrian the first sent a papal sacramentary, the book used by the priest celebrant, with Roman chants to the Carolingian court. Over a brief period in the 8th century, a project overseen by Crotogang, the Bishop of Metz, also compiled the core liturgy of the Roman Mass and prompted its use in Francia and throughout Gaul. It seems Gregorian chant developed in the mid-8th century from a synthesis of Roman and Gallican chants possibly commissioned by the Carolingian rulers in France, although older melodic essentials from Roman chant are clear in the synthesized chant repertory. Chants were modified, influenced by local styles and Gallican chant, and fitted into the theory of the ancient Greek octoechos, eight sounds, the system of modes in a manner that created what later came to be known as the Western system of the eight church modes. The Metz project also invented an innovative musical notation using free-form neumes to show the shape of a remembered melody. And you can see that on the first page of the handout or the PDF that hopefully you have downloaded and are now looking at. It's the offertory of the Jubilate Deo Universa Terra from around 950. 
We're not going to sing that because we don't know how to. And <clears throat> as you can tell, just looking at it, those of you who are used to reading music, it's pretty tricky to make sense of what all those squiggles mean. Maybe next time. This notation was further developed over time, culminating in the introduction of staff lines attributed to Guido d'Arezzo in the early 11th century, what we know today as plain chant notation. The whole body of Frankish Roman Carolingian chant augmented with new chants to complete the liturgical year coalesced into a single body of chant that was called Gregorian. Here in this chapel, you will hear Gregorian chant at every choral service during the week. Compline on Mondays and Tuesdays at 9.30 p.m., Evensong on Wednesdays at 5, and the Solemn Eucharist on Thursdays also at 5. Of course, during COVID days, none of these are actually uh, occurring right now, but we are working on recording them. As an example of one of these hymns, we'll sing the Compline hymn, Te Lucis Ante Terminum, to thee before the end of day. This hymn is found in a hymnary in Irish script of the 8th or early 9th century, but the classical prosody of its two stanzas suggests a much earlier origin, probably 6th century. Next. Te lucis ante terminu. because you could play more than one note at a time. And so the form of organum we're going to use now for this verse is the most primitive form where a group of singers sing a fifth or a fourth above or below the chant. Gregorian chant appeared in a remarkably uniform state across Europe within a short time. Charlemagne, once elevated to Holy Roman Emperor, aggressively spread Gregorian chant throughout his empire to consolidate religious and secular power, requiring the clergy to use the new repertory on pain of death. From English and German sources, Gregorian chant spread north to Scandinavia, Iceland, and Finland. In, 188, in 885, Pope Stephen V banned the Slavonic liturgy, leading to the ascendancy of Gregorian chant in Eastern Catholic lands, including Poland, Moravia, Slovakia, and Austria. The other plain chant repertoires of the Christian West faced severe competition from the new Gregorian chant. Charlemagne continued his father's policy of favoring the Roman rite over the local Gallican traditions. By the ninth century, the Gallican rite and chant had effectively been eliminated, although not without local resistance. The Gregorian chant of the Sarum rite displaced Celtic chant. Gregorian coexisted with Beneventan chant for over a century before Beneventan chant too was abolished by papal decree, 1058. Mozarabic chant survived the influx of the Visigoths and Moors, but not the Roman-backed prelates newly installed in Spain during the Reconquista. Ambrosian chant alone survives to the present day 
preserved in Milan due to the musical reputation and ecclesiastical authority of St. Ambrose. Gregorian chant eventually replaced the local chant tradition of Rome itself, which is now known as Old Roman Chant. In the 10th century, virtually no musical manuscripts were being notated in Italy. Instead, Roman popes imported Gregorian chant from the Holy Roman Emperors in Germany during the 10th and 11th centuries. Reinforced by the legend of Pope Gregory, Gregorian chant was taken to be the authentic original chant of Rome, a misconception that continues to this day. By the 12th and 13th centuries, Gregorian chant had supplanted or marginalized all the other Western plain chant traditions. It's a very sad state of affairs, I think, but all in the interest, I suppose, of uniformity. Here's a taste of Gregorian chant at its most evolved and ornate. This is one of the four great Marian hymns, also called antiphons, each one pertinent to the season, sung at the end of Compline. This is the Salve Regina, probably 11th century, sung during the season from Pentecost to Advent. It was set down in its current form at the Abbey of Cluny in the 12th century, where it was used as a processional hymn on Marian feasts. And you'll find the notation for this and the text and translation on page three of your PDF document. an astonishing beauty to it. Um, 
And those of you who are able to join us for the Zoom session, questions and answers, et cetera, right after this, this uh, lecture, um, Nick is going to teach you how to sing like that in 15 minutes. The massive corpus of Gregorian chant had reached its apogee by the 12th century. It became the source and inspiration for all future developments in the music of the church. We only have time to offer a taste of three samples of those developments. The first two come from what is known as the Notre Dame School, which refers to the group of composers working at or near Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris from about 1160 to 1250 along with the music they produced. This period of musical history has been described as a radical shift of lasting consequence in musical notation and rhythmic composition. The innovative nature of the Notre Dame style stands in contrast to its predecessor, that of the Abbey of Saint Martial in Limoges, replacing the monodic Gregorian chant, what you just heard, with polyphony, i.e. two or more voices singing or playing at the same time. Simple organum, again from the Greek, meaning an instrument like an organ where you can play more than one note at a time, involved the doubling of a chant at intervals of a fourth or fifth above or below. You recall when we sang that uh, hymn, Compline hymn, Te Lucis, on the third verse we sang that simplified kind of organum. For the first time, rhythm became as important as pitch to the extent that the music of this era became, came to be known as musica mensurabilis, music that can be measured. These developments and the notation that evolved laid the foundations of musical practice for the following century. This was also the beginning of the concept of composers with their names attached to their compositions. Prior to this, all music was created by a prolific person by the name of Anonymous. The only composers whose names have come down to us from this time are Léonin and Perrotin. On page four of that PDF document, you will see one of the chants for Easter Day, Alleluia, Pascha Nostrum, Alleluia, Christ our Passover, a sacrifice for us, in its Gregorian chant form, and then followed by an excerpt from Léonin's setting in the form of organum in which the lower voices sing the chant, very stretched out, over which a solo cantor sings an ornate and highly rhythmic melody. We will only sing the initial Alleluia. You can imagine how much time would be required to sing the entire piece. So here's the Alleluia Pascha Nostrum chant followed by Leonin. The second example from the Notre Dame School is Perrotin's famous setting of the chant and text, Viderunt Omnes, based on Psalm 98, 
sung at the masses on Christmas Day. That is on page five of that PDF document. Viderunt omnes fines terre salutare dei nostri. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Along with Leonin's setting of the same text, this is among the earliest pieces of polyphony by a known composer. Here, Perrotin employs three voices to sing an intensely rhythmic counterpoint to the underlying chant sung by the tenor voice, which comes from the Latin tenere, meaning to hold. That's the voice that holds the chant stretched out enormously again. The other voices, counting from the second staff up, are sensibly called duplum, triplum, and quadruplum. Again, the time required to get through the entire text suggests that the church in those days had a decree of tolerance for incredibly lengthy expositions of beauty that is hard to find today. We will sing only the first word. We only have time to sing the first word, viderum. wonderful clash on that last cadence is intentional and uh, obviously you get a sense of the exuberance and joy that uh, Père Rotin wanted to put across in terms of setting that text for Christmas Day and it certainly is rhythmic. Finally we come to the most famous woman of our period, Hildegard of Bingen, 1098 to 1179, who in many ways was something of an outlier in this history. She died before the flourishing of the Notre Dame school, but she wrote a great deal of music and poetry, which, although inspired no doubt by Gregorian chant, was entirely original and highly dramatic. Hildegard was a German Benedictine abbess, writer, composer, philosopher, Christian mystic visionary, and polymath. Hildegard's parents offered her as an oblate to the Benedictine monastery at the Diese Bodenberg in Germany's Rhineland Palatinate, where she lived for 39 years as part of a growing community of women attached to the male monasteries. Double monasteries 
those combining separate communities of monks and nuns were not unknown during this period. The monastery of Bridget of Kildare in Ireland was a double monastery with both men and women supervised by an abbess. In 1150, Hildegard and about 20 nuns moved to the St. Rupertsburg Monastery, and 15 years later, she founded a second monastery for her nuns at Eibingen, where she spent the last years of her life. Hildegard's output is truly astonishing. Her musical compositions and poetry, her writings on science and medicine, and her visionary theology grabbed the attention of countless contemporaries, including Popes Eugene II and Anastasius IV, the famous Abbot Suger, Frederick I, Barbarossa, and Saint Bernard of Clairvaux being among her significant fans. Hildegard has been finally recognized as a saint by branches of the Roman Catholic Church, and on the 7th of October, 2012, Pope Benedict XVI named her a doctor of the church. We're going to sing one of her hymns to the Virgin Mary, O Virga Ac Diadema, and that's on page six of the handout. We will sing it imagining we are in one of those double monasteries where the monks and nuns occasionally worship together, you will hear a form of organum where the chant is underlaid by a single tone or drone held by a few lower voices. But remember, the chant itself is Hildegard's composition, inspired by Gregorian style, but hers. Sometimes the drone you hear is doubled at the interval of a fifth. The ecstatic quality of this composition, like so many of her other pieces, has made her justly famous. O Virga Ac Diadema.
think ecstatic is a very good word to describe that music. By the end of the 16th century, for reasons too numerous to deal with here, Gregorian chant had essentially completely died out, and that remained the case until well into the 19th century. In 1832, Dom Prosper Guéranger acquired the Priory of Solem in the Loire region and set about reviving the Benedictine monastic tradition in what became the Abbey of saint pierre Solem. Since its restoration, Solem has been dissolved by the French government no less than four times. In 1880, 82, and 83, the monks were ejected by force, but receiving hospitality in the neighborhood succeeded each time in re-entering their abbey. Re-establishing the divine office was among Guéranger's priorities, but no proper chant books existed. Many monks were sent out to libraries throughout Europe to find relevant chant manuscripts. In 1889, after decades of research, the monks of Solem released the first book in a planned series the Paléographie Musicale. On the evidence of congruence throughout various manuscripts, Solem was able to work out a practical reconstruction. This reconstructed chant was finally approved by Pope Pius X and was compiled as the Liber Usualis. Needless to say, there has been much divergence of opinion among scholars regarding Gregorian chant performance practices, and no doubt this discussion will continue to prove productive well into the future. In closing, Simon Weil, the 20th century French philosopher, mystic, and political activist, wrote, it is quite conceivable that someone who is a passionate music lover might at the same time be evil or corrupt as a person. But I would find it hard to believe that such a thing could be true of anyone who has a thirst for Gregorian chant. So clearly, if you prefer not to become an evil or corrupt person, you should develop a thirst for Gregorian chant as quickly as possible. 